I'm coming to you from Vancouver's 10th Avenue bike path, which connects the east and west sides. Today's a sunny day, perfect for cycling, biking, taking the bus to the beach. Yeah, there's this push around the world to create more what are called 15 minute cities. Do you think Vancouverites could benefit from having all their uh, needs within one 15 minute radius, one neighborhood? Yeah, I think um, Vancouverites could really benefit from the 15 minute city idea. Yeah, I think this is something that that we've talked about a bit in, in school. I'm studying landscape architecture and that's something that's really emphasized. I used to live down in Marpool and it was a nice community but it was like not quite as convenient but like living in this area like there's just like I just think of like the time I saved was having everything local as opposed to like trying to travel everywhere and get things. So yeah absolutely I'm, I'm all about that. Imagine you live in a city where to go to the grocery store, which is closest to your house, you have to get in your car and drive there because the walk would take 45 minutes versus a 10 minute car ride. This is a reality for millions of people around the world. Sometimes you have to travel across the city just to find a specialty store, go to a museum, or in a lot of pre-pandemic cases, traverse the entire city just to go to work. Five days a week, for the rest of your working career. Now, what if I told you that there was a movement underway that would bring your job, amenities, and social activities within no more than a 15-minute bike ride or walk from your front door? The future is here, and it's coming to life in Paris. The 15-minute city is taking the world by storm. From Paris to Bologna, Madrid to Bogota, the cities we've known are becoming a thing of the past. And quite frankly, why not? According to Move It, the average person spends two hours on public transportation to get to and from work in Paris. Meantime, Forbes notes that Paris intends on removing 60,000 private car parking spaces by 2024 as part of Mayor Anne Hidalgo's effort to create self-sufficient communities within one of Europe's oldest cities. However, Bloomberg warns that European cities may be better suited for this model rather than the vast, sprawling metropolises of North America. So, if we look into the past to understand why our urban landscapes, the cities we call home, are the way they are, then we can begin to implement changes to make them more accessible by foot or bike. However, change never comes quickly, but sometimes it happens faster than anyone ever realized. I'm Miriam Sobe. In this episode of Changing Places, we're going to explore the world of 15-minute cities with Joe Davis, an expert with over 25 years experience on complex urban change projects for public and private sector clients from Avis and Young, as well as thoughts from Professor Carlos Moreno, the man on the forefront of this shift in how we live, work, and play, and insight into what a 15-minute city would mean to a committed carless citizen Attorney Nima Davari from Los Angeles. My name is Nima Davari. I'm an attorney. I live in East Hollywood, and I'm a LA Metro public transit rider. It is a lifestyle choice that I've made to not have a car and try to navigate this city with the public transit systems that we have. Um, it is limiting in that there are specific places that are easy to get to, and then certain places that are almost impossible to get to unless you have unlimited time. I don't think spending two hours to go five miles is a reasonable amount of time to spend in transit. That was Nima Davari giving us some insight into the challenges of navigating Los Angeles without the use of a car. I'm Miriam So. Welcome back to Changing Places. In order to understand how we got here, I'm going to chat with Joe Davis, who has over 25 years experience on complex urban change projects for public and private sector clients. I'm going to take a deep dive with her into the world of 15-minute cities in the United Kingdom to see who is doing it right and what it means for the future of work, play, and society within our ever-evolving world. Joe Davis, welcome to Changing Places. Joe, how did we get to a place in our world where most of what we need and do is located so far from our homes or immediate neighbourhoods? I think you've got to look really back quite a long way to get to that answer. I mean, the Industrial Revolution was fundamental in all of that. And then that moved through the 19th and 20th century with zonal planning. So in effect, what we did is we put homes in one location and we zoned the employment in another location and the shops in the other. And of course, then with the growth of the car, 
that was absolutely fine. So that's how we got to zonal planning. What obviously has changed in the UK is that that was based on a 1947 Planning Act. When we then turned around to the 1990 Planning Act, it was all about sustainable transport. It was actually all about actually what does a sustainable city mean? And therefore we had to question whether actually those barriers to connecting places was failing us. Yeah, in some cities like London, the theatre district is in the West End and more niche high streets like those in Kensington and Hampstead are located on the other side of the city. Is the urban plan of our current cities restrictive by design or just by folks buying into this idea that this is how things are and this is just how it will continue to be? Well, it's really interesting. I mean, the the starting point is that still 80% of our population has a car. So immediately the first thought is to go by car or to travel by car. So that connection is done by car in the first instance. Second point that you just kind of raised, which I think is largely important more so in the UK than possibly elsewhere globally, is the fact that actually the history of how our cities has evolved influences where things are located, but also how you travel around places. And that's been really important, therefore, in actually allowing us to redress this point and to actually challenge whether travelling to leisure and travelling to shops by car is the only option. And those, those barriers are being broken down now. Let's hear from Professor Carlos Moreno, the man at the forefront of the 15-minute city. Fact, we need today to redefine uh, our urban lifestyle because these uh, urban uh, and territorial uh, lifestyles are not sustainable. One of the most uh, relevant contribution is uh, our crazy commute for going from my home to our office, two, three hours for a round trip. And at the same time, all actions uh, uh, linked with uh, this hectic urban arterial lifestyles. We need to, to change uh, not only for preserving our environment, but for preserving our social link. Prior to Mayor Anne Hidalgo's commitment to making Paris a 15-minute city, there were places like cities. Amsterdam prided themselves on being very accessible. But was that simply because of the size of, of the city or was that planned out? And are you seeing anything similar to that in the UK? So I think without question that you know, Paris, New Amsterdam, so they were planned out. That approach was in policy. That 15-minute walking place was in policy. Whilst it's best practice in the UK in terms of the Town and Country Planning Association and the Royal Town Planning Institute, it's not policy, it's not dictated. So therefore, our ability is 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 influenced by that. But then what's really happened in the UK, which I think is really interesting, is that we started to challenge what makes a good place. And instead of designing for the car or designing for specific locations, what we're just thinking is, you know, but not what it looks like on the outside. How does it function? How does that space function? How do people move, move through it? In the city centres, what do people need to have a successful lifestyle? So actually, therefore, moving away from the need from a car into actually, I need a really good cycle route or I really need a really good place to sit outside to enjoy my environment. And certainly COVID in the UK fundamentally changed that when everybody flipped from eating inside to outside. So therefore, those spaces, that road space and the quality and the air quality of those spaces to allow people to sit outside fundamentally flipped over overnight. And that's really changed, not through policy and dictate, but actually through people's demands and wants of, and expectations of a city. That's what's really started to change and that's what makes it really interesting in terms of the way we move forward now. Stay tuned for the next part. And just a reminder, Changing Places is a podcast brought to you by Avis and Young that continues to explore and question our complex relationship with the built world around us. I'm your host, Miriam Sobe. I hope you're liking the show so far. If so, please share Changing Places with your friends. So I do. I do think we are quite a ways away from having pockets of 15-minute cities where you can walk or bike everywhere. I think if you add rail and bus to that definition, it becomes a little bit more feasible. I think actually East Hollywood as a sub-neighborhood of Hollywood is a great place. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who, through circumstance, must spend four hours commuting two hours each way due to income restrictions, education restrictions, whatever it is that has them doing that. 
But that's not great. Like, cities are supposed to provide a service. Like, the mass transit systems are not for-profit systems. They are government services in order to help people move through the cities. When it's not built right, when you have to spend four hours doing it because you have no other option, that's not really feasible, and more people will not adopt using alternative modes of transportation when they have to wait a long time. Welcome back to Changing Places. We just heard from Nima Davari, but before we get back to my conversation with Joe Davis, who has over 25 years' experience on complex urban change projects, let's go back to Vancouver to hear what folks think about 15-minute cities in their community. I don't know that Vancouver would benefit from having it broken up into small units of walkability that kind of tends to lead, lead to exclusivity. But I am all for walking and biking to get where you need to go to. I have a car, but I rarely, if ever, drive it. So it means a lot to me to be able to live in a neighborhood where I can get to where I need to get to on foot or by bike. But I would be apprehensive about, like right now, I'm walking to, from one neighborhood to a very different neighborhood. And I wouldn't like to see myself limited to just that 15-minute walk, just out of interest and curiosity and expansiveness of a cultural experience. One neighborhood is not going to have everything I need. So I'm not a big fan of having everything I need in just one 15-minute walk. Although I do understand that that's very helpful and useful to some people. When it comes to the UK, are there cities that are committing to becoming 15-minute cities? And on the flip side of that, are there cities that are just dropping the ball? Not necessarily 15-minute cities in the way that you're perceiving them, in, in, in your kind of your Paris and your Amsterdam, where there's a dictate to that. In terms of the quality of those locations, all, all of the cities are tested about walkability. What makes a good, safe city for people to move around it, live in it without reliance on the planet, on the car? That's what's changing. So in effect, it's a parallel process to your 15-minute cities, but it's being taken from a different angle. I, I can't speak for all Vancouverites, but it's definitely something that appeals to me. Yeah, and that's just because I decided um, many years ago to go car-free and... And that's as a result of living in Japan for a year and relying on mass transit. Tokyo was like highly transited, like there were trains and transit everywhere to go everywhere and was so convenient. So I came back to Vancouver and I just wanted to see if I could live that lifestyle here. And I'm very pro 15 minute cities. Can you tell me about how and why Bristol, England, from your point of view, has adopted a 15-minute city ethos and how it will benefit the city and its residents in the long term? So I think Bristol was ahead of the game. So when it had its cycle strategy in 2000, so it was the European cycle city, that changed the goalposts and the way that people were intended or encouraged to move around the city. So we started to create the Brunel Mile that went from the train station right the way through the city centre and into the residential areas, that created the opportunities and the space for people to walk and cycle safely across the city. We're seeing policies that require every development on the harbour side to have a harbour side walkway in front of it so you can do a circular walk around it. So there's a number of really good policies that have been put forward by the city through its planning process to blend that kind of 15-minute city centre and that removal of cars from the city. So it's a carrot and stick approach. Again, Professor Carlos Moreno. Seattle is totally committed in this way of a more compact city, more uh, mixity for offering more and more intersections between the functional uh, services, mixity for having a more social intersections. Joe, how does a 15-minute city work for young families who have kids? I think there you hit one of the biggest challenges that we've got at the moment. So the city centre lifestyle that we're talking about, that high-rise apartments, that no need for a car, is very much at the moment the younger persons, the single person, the young couples, the professional couples kind of safe space. And I think that what we we need to look at really carefully moving forward is actually how do we keep our families in the UK in our city centres very much like we see across the water in Chicago. It's quite common there. So that, that then becomes about quality spaces. 
So actually, what does a quality park look like? How do we ensure that within our cities, those things are within a 15 minute walkable distance, that the school's within a 15 minute walkable distance? This does come back to the air quality as well. If you've got a qual- an air quality and you've got safe parks and you've got good spaces within your cities, then people will stay in there. But ultimately, that is the flow that the UK needs to address is actually that movement out to a house in suburbia and then that need to travel is, is, is where we're at comes back however to that piece about that 15 minute neighborhood and actually around that school where you're living can you walk to all of the things you need to within that part of your suburb or within that part of your development and historically right up until the 80s early 90s the UK was just designing housing estates it wasn't designing mixed uses on the edges of our city centre. That's fundamentally changed. We're, we're putting mixed uses in there. So there is employment, there is recreation. It's it's interesting learning about these 15-minute cities because where I live, I'm in Chicago, and everything is walking distance. And every time we think about moving, I'm just like, the kids' school is here, the grocery store is here, the library. Like, we work from home. Do we really want to move somewhere where we have to drive to the grocery store? <laughs> it's definitely changing. And therefore, what you've also seen, of course, is that the grocery store is changing. You know, we, we lived in a 30-year decade of out-of-town retail stores, large seats of car parking. That's changing. In London, we are redeveloping those sites, still having a retail store, but having residential above it and residential within the car park, because actually people's mindsets are changing. And I think that that's only going to accelerate. How feasible would it be to to take that and replicate a 15 minute city into a larger city like London, which is quite fast? I think in terms of London, in terms of our big accommodations like Birmingham and Manchester, you do it in zones. So there are quarters within the city and that 15 minute walk around is around, a, say, a quarter or a neighbourhood. And again, that's really, really increased in popularity and strength due to COVID because people actually were working at home and therefore were then starting to rely on their neighbourhood facilities. And most of those neighbourhood facilities were really good. But again, you've still got um, 4% of the country travelling one mile. You know, it, it, so getting in a car to travel just one mile, which is such a walkable distance. So kind of there's still a mindset to go. The other policy piece, which is really important, new developments where they're focused around our public transport networks, they don't have any cars. So kind of you have car free developments now in our cities because they have good public transport and they have good cycle facilities for, for parking. So all those sorts of measures allow you to start making those changes. But I think in terms of our bigger uh, metropolitan areas, it's very much about those 15 minutes neighbourhoods rather than a 15 minute city per se. Let's hear from Nima Davari in Los Angeles. Despite my criticisms of the LA metro system, I am opting into the system. I could purchase a car if I wanted to, but I really believe in mass transit. I really believe in reducing my carbon footprint, our collective carbon footprint. And so I would really like to see the system succeed. And it is one of those things, if you build it, they will come, but you need the funding in order to build it. And if they're not coming, then you don't have the funding. So it's a real chicken egg situation. One of the great things about being a public transit rider uh, for the company that I work for is that by foregoing my parking space, they then subsidize my Metro Pass. So my travel costs are literally zero dollars outside of the occasional ride share or other mode I might use. I do rent a car sometimes if I need to do X, Y, or Z. But yeah, I ride around the city completely free simply because I gave up one parking space to a major employer. And I'm very grateful for that. Is the idea of 15-minute city then only adaptable to established cities that, that have this sort of infrastructure already in place? Or is there potential to redevelop or change things in these very car specific types of areas? I think without question, everything's adaptable. So some of those principles will work in some cities and not in others. In Bristol, we're seeing subways coming up to ground to improve the safety of people moving around them. So there's lots and lots of measures that can be done. And I think there's a well, it's a bit of a best practice piece here. And I think that our city leaders across the UK are constantly talking about these things. We at Avis and Young are constantly sharing our knowledge and our good good ex- best practice from certain cities into our other regeneration strategies. So there's a whole learning curve continually moving forward. But I think the I think there is a time there where 
it's not unreasonable to expect that the car won't be the predominant movement in the city centre. And actually, we will see those car spaces, you know, when, when we're so short of land, that those streets will actually be reduced in size and they will become development parcels. It's a really exciting time. Joe, I'm curious, as we look forward, what does the future hold in store for 15-minute cities, the governments which run them, and the people who live within them? Let's dive into that in a moment. But first, more insight from Professor Carlos Moreno. We need uh, to give uh, to the reality, to streets, to the square, to places, to neighborhood, human environment uh, livability, uh, because uh, the neighborhood are necessary for uh, hosting this uh, humanity. And our cities uh, today, unfortunately, aren't uh, we have built big metropolises, big cities, uh, without considering the importance uh, of living uh, humanity? I mean, it's a good idea. The citizens of Vancouver meet, have all their needs met within 15 minutes where they live. I think, well, what are all the needs? If I have a need to go swimming in the ocean, how are you going to do that within 15 minutes of where I live? I mean, you can have a bathroom, you can have a place to eat, you can have a place to work. I don't know. Is that the limit of our needs? I don't think so. I think it's, I think it's a good idea. I don't know you can meet everybody's need. You know? If we look ahead, Joe, to the next five years or so, where do you think we'll be when it comes to 15-minute cities around the world? The critical things I think we're going to see is we're going to see a significant intensification of development around our public transport hubs. So some of the work that we've done in London on Crossrail is actually what is the value of going high and tall and dense development around a new station? Because that's sustainable and that that's the accessibility piece that people want to. I think without question, we'll be seeing that. I think we're already seeing gentrification into our historic industrial areas so therefore we're already then allowing that opportunity for greater walking cities because where we've had core industrial areas within our city centres from just a historic piece they're they're being redeveloped and that's therefore allowing those connections to come in place but also the really important piece is you know 20 years ago every development we had had two car parking spaces you know move on now very few car parking spaces in any of our developments looking forward it won't even be a conversation so the process of development is changing and also there's a commerciality here that, you know, that, that it's not needed people aren't having one car you know car share is a much stronger thing and that connection and that safety around the city is being considered far more important the next thing will be the redevelopment of multi-story car parks for, for, for housing it's on its way well i want to thank you so much for joining us joe davis pleasure I'd like to thank Joe Davis, Professor Carlos Moreno, and Nima Davari for taking time to give us insight into the world of 15-minute cities. Before we go, let's hear more from Professor Moreno one last time. I am humble because I consider that this 15 minutes concept, it, this is not my 15 minutes concept. I am the initiator. I am the creator. But at the same time, uh, we need to launch an idea and we need that this idea uh, will become uh, an autonomous idea for different uh, cultural, social, economical concepts. For being uh, one framework for transforming our urban life, even if the impact for transforming our urban life is uh, the 10%, 5%, 2%, of my initial idea, this is enough for be happy. I think the possibility of living in a city where everything is within a 15 minute walk or bike ride is really exciting. For so long, we as citizens of the world and our neighborhoods have driven or commuted for over an hour just to go to an appointment or decent grocery store. And with gas prices going up, the trip has been made even less appealing. The mere idea of every city having neighborhoods which cater to their residents with social infrastructure, amenities, entertainment, and even co-working spaces to allow people not just to work from home, but down the street from their house, is a concept which could change the world. Change doesn't happen overnight, but maybe 
just maybe the spark of the 15-minute city will ignite into a global demand for choice, options, and above all, more say into the immediate built world around us. I'm Miriam So. This is Changing Places. Join us for our next episode as we explore the world of planned communities. From Celebration, Florida to Prince Charles's Poundbury in the UK, we're going to take a deep dive into this unique part of the built world and see why it has so many fans, detractors, and what it means for your community. Changing Places is brought to you by Avis and Young. Our producer is Andrew Pemberton Fowler. Our sound engineer is Patrick Emile. Our producer assistant is Hugh Perkich. Additional production support is provided by Jar Audio.